Star Trek The Next Generation was a show. Star Trek The Next Generation everybody was I interact a show with. that I started watching when I was a really little kid. Can this you believe it's been it 30 years since Star Trek The Next Generation first Star Trek The Next Generation was my life as a kid. It was the escape from reality. Welcome to Next Generation's First Generation, where Patrick Delmore and Sasha Shouties take a look back into their favorite childhood show, Star Trek The Next Generation. This is where we attempt to reconcile how we felt as children watching the show and looking back as old farts now in our late 30s, almost 40s. Square one! Just math. Square, math, math, man, math, man, math, math, man. Math, man. Beep, beep. <laughs> and um, uh, Blackstone. The amazing Blackstone, yeah. Who was a real magician, like yeah. outside of that. that no, really there cool. were some good sketches. And the, some great songs, too. The music video stuff on there was top notch. Yeah, I remember watching that a couple of years ago here. Nine, nine, nine. <laughs> that crazy number nine. It's perfectly consistent, and it works out every time. <laughs> the Hunted, is this the one where they have the genetically engineered troops that are imprisoned on a moon? Yes. No, it's where Riker and Data go on a hunting trip. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Riker accidentally shoots Data yeah. in the face. No, it's like, a yeah. yeah. Sorry, I thought you were a space deer. Now, Data, I want you to get out there and find us a snipe. God, you know, that would be hilarious if they did that. Is it means you got Wesley just comes running up in his, you know, space hunt gear and <laughs> tells Data, well, you know, Riker and I are going onto the holodeck to go on a hunting trip. And then Data comes along and he's literally dressed like Elmer Fudd. No, it's like, well, it's like, well, Mr. Crusher, how are, how are the grades of your most recent exams? Well, I haven't gotten my grades yet. Oh, that's right, because I grade you. <laughs> he, like, pulls them up. <laughs> 9.7, 9 9.3, 9 9.9. Ooh, didn't make it to a 10 on any of those. <laughs> All right, welcome back to the year 1990. In our second episode for that year, but our 11th episode of the third season of Star Trek The Next Generation, we are once again a large group today. Uh, to my immediate left is Matt. Sorry, the way right is Matt. To my left is Jem. Hello. Followed by a regular co-host of the show, Sasha. Hello. And a returning guest, Nigel. Hey, everyone. And today we are going to watch The Hunted, James Cromwell's first of many appearances in the Star Trek The Next Generation yeah, the universe. Being the founding father of Star Trek. Yeah, as uh, Scott Gardner on Star Trek Monthly Mondays would call him. The wussier version of uh, that from Cochrane. <laughs> but yeah, a, uh, let's give our countdown of five, four, three, two, one, and away we go. So there's the planet, the Enterprise is going along. We got a captain's log here of a stardate something. Yeah. Angosia! So, so they've come to a place where there's some people that have a very similar map painting to the uh, powerful women planet. Mm -hmm. It's a different time of day. But they uh, they want to join the Federation. Well, they're, they're definitely into joining the Federation because everyone wears a jumpsuit. So they figured, hey, you know, we, we can do uniforms just like you guys. It's the premier country club of the era. Yeah. I would love it uh, if on the Orville or something they started using the term uh, Twilight Zone planets. <laughs> it's like we always find these worlds where they like seem like paradise, but there's like some massive caveat. And that's what they, that's what they have here is they're a, um, they're, a soci they're a society that like the United States, a majority of their population are in prison. Hmm. And that was sort of what they had to do because they couldn't figure out how to resettle uh, soldiers after their last war. Mm -hmm. So they all live on a pe all of the soldiers that they have ever had, and they're and they're volunteer they're actual volunteers. They're not they don't have a draft, but after the war they have to live in a penal under a penal system. And so one of their soldiers has escaped, and this is sort of their why they want to 
um, become part of the Federation is it's another you know Twilight Zone sci-fi conundrum is everything is perfect but we don't have a contingency for if it breaks if it breaks we're screwed and so they got a guy that escaped and they have nothing they can do about it but now with Federation protection they can basically have the Federation be their own private police force and catch this guy so now, Data and Worf are going to capture this guy. Yeah. That's a perfectly placed asteroid. Look at that. Mm. Looks a more lot, like a brownie in A space. lot better in HD. That's one you can really notice. You know that? how funny would that be if that was a Mystery Science Theater 3000 planet? <laughs> now, it's interesting. Data is in, uh, is in command of the Enterprise right now. Mm-hmm. And now he, and jo- now he and Jordy are of equal rank. Um. Uh, but Wesley, being an, an ensign, at one point drops rank and calls just calls Data by his name, which I found really weird. I get I get Jordy doing it, even though when they're off duty, they're they're equals. They're all three they're all three buddies. Rank doesn't matter. But when you're responding to the command, God, this looks so much better in, in HD than it does in SD. This is the one I've noticed the most of the changes that they made. Um, Data. But it's just interesting that yeah, it does it right there. Go? The data doesn't correct him. He's like, no he's like, you know, no, you call me commander when I'm sitting in this chair, Wesley. Well, he's not even a formal ensign yet, is he? No, he's an acting ensign. So it's even more important that he remembers to act on rank. Protocol. Yeah, it's possible that data pulls him aside later. Yeah, I absolutely. Says, I didn't want to do it on an open comms on the yeah. bridge. I I but, absolutely love it that. Picard and Riker look at each other befounded, like, eluded the Enterprise. That's like every episode yeah. the Enterprise gets pulled. <laughs> I, I, I thought we fixed this. I thought, you know... You... Oh, geez. So, this is the 11th episode of the third season, January 8th, 1990. So, you are just trying to figure out, if you lived in the 90s, how to wear your hyper-color parachute pants. Yes! And your slap bracelets. Yes! <laughs> trying to figure out how to transition from the 80s to the what? 90s. It was a very fun and awkward time for all of us. Well, um, for most of us. For most of us, yes. Uh, well, you were just a glimmer in your father's eye, Nigel. <laughs> I, I believe so. I believe so, yes. I came two years later. Oh, okay. I had just too. gotten a... Uh, like an enormous box of crayons for Christmas that year, and it had fluorescent crayons in it, and I was so excited. In uh, 1990, let's see, Christmas, uh, everybody thought I was into model trains, <laughs> and so every every present I got was either a little bit of track or lots of train models, and I, I think I cried. Oh. I, was, I, was, I, was, I, mean, I felt bad that I cried, too. <laughs> But right about this time, I'm surrounded by all these models. I yeah. built them because I imagined I had nothing else to better to do. But one of the models was a model Burger King. And Yay, that was, that was kind of cool. cool. Yeah, so this is uh, kind of puts context. Uh, this episode I really liked as a kid, but the way it shot, the way that the se- sets are built, it almost felt like a season one set. Oh, very much uh, yeah. so. And, it, and it's just like you have a few of these throwback episodes where the plot is very much a, a mature plot, but the sets look like uh, something that should have been from a long time ago. So uh, this is uh, definitely Den- Dennis McCarthy music, and we won't hold it against him. We love him very much. So uh, this is James Cornwell, you said? Cromwell. Cromwell. Yes, and he is, uh, for those who don't know, uh, Star Trek, uh, Starfleet kind of has a, an obsession over this character called Zeph from Cockrum. He's kind of like the George Washington of Starfleet, where he set, he, he's the guy who invented warp drive for the humans and was able to initiate first contact with the Vulcans, which kind of, you know, it's got the ball rolling, and, and uh, this is the gentleman who plays that character. This is the second gentleman to play that character. Who's the first? As some guy from the original series. Did they have a Zephyr Cockney? Yes, they had an episode original? where they found him on a strand on a planet. 
Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, it's it's a, it's a very interesting episode. He's a very different character than what we see in First Contact. So here we go. Uh, apparently, the uh, they found the star drive of the ship that they were trying to chase, and they've tractored it in. I missed the part where Riker and Picard beam back onto the ship to take care of the situation. I don't, they, they didn't show it. It's just they showed them giving each other a look, and then there they were back on the ship. Oh. Yeah, it's like, you know, cop dramas. You don't see them park the patrol car every time and get out. Suddenly they're standing over the body. It's interesting how the shield's automatically raised to prevent the, the uh, impact. Didn't his friend that ran away from the ship also bounce off the shields? Whose friend? When um, he Wesley's buddy that didn't get into Starfleet that like oh, ran down to the planet. Yes, he, he, he bounced also off the, something where he bounced off the shield. He bounced off the atmosphere. <laughs> he off the shields. And that does happen. Actually, yeah. we've had satellites do that. Mostly Chinese satellites, but. So there's the escape pod. Now Wesley's <laughs> Wesley's kind of I you know he's kind of fallen in love with this guy. In fact, I think Wesley has a thing for powerful outlaws. Uh, well, they, they don't have a they don't have a scene together. They don't. It's like nah, yeah. After the whole uh, outrageous Okana thing, um, they kind of keep those guys. Yeah, away. yeah. <laughs> so uh, your yeah, your your uh, holodeck privileges are still at racquetball level. Which means that you could go into the holodeck, not turn it on, and play with a handball. <laughs> You're off duty. So they've got they've got this guy in in transporter freeze. I guess he tries to shoot his weapon. It's like why wouldn't just, you just transport yeah, him to the brig? Worf security team proves themselves to be complete suck in this episode. Oh yeah, like ju- they're just awful. I know, it must be really easy not, to be though? security in the 24th century. They're never as bad as this. You know, it's funny because O'Brien is a fighter. If you look yeah. at the history of him, like, he should be able to... But O'Brien to, actually does pretty well for himself, too. He, he could toe up with this guy, I think, if, if it was future O'Brien. Uh, Even now, he's, he's doing pretty good. These guys are literally oh. just getting tossed around. Oh, yeah, he does the smart thing and just shoots them from across from the From a distance, because he knows from that this guy distance. in close quarters is... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so here comes Worf with his football player charge. He's going to look around the corner like, is it safe? Oh, is it? Is it clear? Yep, let's go. <laughs> you actually would so not. Gonna, so when you're struggling with there a again. gun like that, you do not charge at him. Yeah. That's just... So this they're is a playing, terrible fight scene. They're playing <laughs> Twister without a map. Yeah, bu- buckle in, Jim. There's going to be a lot of these in this episode. Terrible fight scenes? Yes. They're just going to hold the phaser to his belly and push the button. <laughs> this was worse when and we Warf, named this. Warf should have been like, sir, back away. You don't know what he has in his mouth. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Right? Don't kiss him this time. Yeah. <laughs> and here's O'Brien just like, this is one to put in the logbook. I mean, this is almost as bad when we beamed all those chickens and they got into the corridor. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, the prison psychologist. So they recommend they keep him sedated. So I'm assuming with the off hypo spray? Yeah. Really? Because I was going to relax my security for a few minutes every hour. And we're going to find out, you know, that what all this stuff Crawl saying about him being like extremely violent and very cunning. He's not talking about him as an individual. He's talking about his class. The criminal, yeah. what he considers the criminal class. So here's the first intrigue. The, the, the technology cannot detect the soldier. Yeah. There are no life signs. Which would be a big thing they would have had to know about, about um, letting them into the Federation that they made them so that they had no life signs. Probably, you know, whatever version of the Geneva Convention they have prevents that from being something you can do to soldiers. Well, honestly, that would be the perfect soldier for, like, Section 31. Man, that is a cushy cell right there. <laughs> I don't I don't like this. That it's like, she just happens to be, like, strolling around the ship, and then, he, you know, has something happen. I feel the happen. feels. 
They should have what what it should have been was that she's in her office and she's like, Captain, I heard you you know brought this prisoner aboard from such mm-hmm. and such, and he's like, Yeah, I get go 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 check it out. So, yeah, because like you're gonna tell me there's nobody else <laughs> with fitful dreams on the Enterprise. Who yeah, might. I worked in a prison for. Eight years. I was going to say that, but I didn't know. And I did. it is completely inappropriate just to stroll into an isolation uh, oh, unit and start talking to somebody. And it's just the the guard would be like, "The fudge you doing, man?" Well, the fact that it's just one door that has general access to the ship, then that you, get out. you just walk out the one door and oh look, we're in the main corridor. What it would be if there was nobody in there with their level of technology is he would w- wake up and the computer voice would be like, "You are you are being detained on the USS Enterprise." You know, this is the this is the date, and I never understood why they have all these bulkheads in the prison cell. Well, a lot of a lot of ligature l- risk there. They designed the ship, and then they had a bunch of other people come in and say where the brig was going to be. That had nothing to do with the design. That's they why. they just yeah. reconverted. Yeah. Is this their first brig? No. Scene? No? No, we've had other ones. Yeah. They've redesigned it like multiple times. Okay, that's why I'm that's why I'm uh, my memory fails me. I do like the visual effect on the force field. That's always been cute. Yeah, I'm trying to find it. So back in the 80s, you could probably buy a jacket like that where it's all tore up. Oh, well, that's part of his jumpsuit. The, the jumpsuit with no arms. At least he has a shirt. Do they mistreat you, though? Not at all. I'm very comfortable. But again, we don't we don't know what constitutes mistreatment on their world, mm-hmm. which is kind of dumb because they're trying to become part of the Federation, and it's like one of those huge caveats that they just didn't notice until one of the prisoners left. You always visit the prisoners, and you were... I love how he calls her out on why. Why do you just come by and visit the prisoner? Is this your job? But no, she now just they've felt never him. said if they if Earth still has uh, still has a, a penal system at all in this time. I think they've mentioned the penal colony in New Zealand. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's right, but that's in um, Voyager. Which would have been around because they've been on the Mew Colony, and then they've also got a the one that uh, they've got a couple of them out there. Mm-hmm. That's right, because that's where uh, Paris was in one of them. Wasn't yeah, it? yeah, but it's not like prison now. It's where no, it's where you go and you just can't leave the planet. Yeah, you just think, you know you have a job. You know Paris was repairing the whatever in the garden, and it's true. Um, it's true. It's it's you know true controlled socialism where it's like. They're like, okay, so you've done you've done this. Now we're going to assess you and be like, what are what is the best thing for you to do? You don't have the choice. Of, you don't have the choice of it anymore. But you're not going to be locked in a cell. You've just given yourself over to not be able to choose what what path your life will take. Yeah, and if we really don't like you, we'll give you over to the Klingons. And they repente your ass. They've done a really good job writing this character as a jaded, paranoid of authority individual. Well, it's a, it's it's like a commentary on the Marines, than the type of training that they used to go through, where they completely bring you down and restructure you from the brain up on your mentality with absolutely no thought of what happens when you're not a Marine. That's why there's the term, once a Marine, always a Marine, is there is no transition from being a former to being a former Marine. There's, there's, for the longest time, there's one of those, we're going to train you to kill people without a second thought. And there is, you know, it's, you know, it's in the Marines, it's you're a rifleman for everyone's a rifleman first. And so that's the mentality with you, which is we're just going to train you to kill. And what happens when we're done with you is really not yeah. our concern. It's just... Well, we, that's um, where the Enterprise crew comes in, is that they've inherited this individual, and Troy wants to figure out what's going on. Yeah, I had a ma- an amazing teacher in high school, and he was, he was a former Marine, and he was very, you know, what, the, what they did was horrible. But somebody, somebody took a, somebody tried to kick him one time. And he jumped back from it. He goes, if that kick had made contact, you would have been an extremely sorry young man because that training does not go away. Yeah, there's, it, it becomes a, a muscle reflex yeah. and that you never lose. And that's, yeah. yeah. It's, oh, so the guy who plays our uh, lead 
That uh, guy, Jeff McCarthy. Oh. I wonder if he's uh, related to Dennis by any chance. Anyway, uh, he passed away. But here's the big... They're going to bring up what his criminal record is, and he doesn't have one because the way the society works is when you're done, when you're done serving in the military, you go, you're you're in the penal system. Oh, I'm wrong. It's probably not even considered the penal system. It's just the retirement it's probably, plan. They, they, yeah, they literally probably just think of it as your retirement, like a retirement colony, because he said they're well fed, well taken care of, given you know, sheltered. They probably are, but it's one of those. But you can't ever leave the planet. Mm -hmm. It's they don't treat them. They're not. But it's one of those. You yeah. You you lose your freedom forever if you become a soldier. I don't think they think of them as criminals because they even state later on that well, why didn't we try to deprogram? Well, because we might need them later on. Yeah, you just kind of keep them on standby. Yeah, it's but, like putting your rifle on a shelf. But these guys don't like to be kept we, as pets in storage. Well, they Nobody told does. they told the Enterprise that he was a criminal. Well, yeah, they just say that so in order yeah. to get Picard to help because, you know, the it, Federation's not going to want to round up a decorated war hero who's done nothing but try to escape confinement. You know, they probably would have gotten more out of the Federation if they just said, we have this brainwashed guy with these special skills who is a danger to anybody who poses a threat. We him and his team were trying to escape to the Los Angeles underground where they will go and help people. Yeah. <laughs> Right. It's like we got a guy, we, you know, we got a guy on board the ship that's kind of familiar with that situation. So uh, here's something cool about Jeff McCarthy. No, he is not dead, but yes, he was chosen by Chuck Jones to be the voice of Michigan J Frog. That's what? awesome. Yep. Yeah. Awesome. So he's the night. Yeah, he was uh, for all the old ads for the WB. Mm -hmm. Hello, my darling. Hello, my baby. Hello, my ragtime guy. Now we present on the WB another bad show that no one will see. <laughs> mm -hmm. And he was also a running. Uh, he was a running uh, character for Dave Letterman when they ever they needed to pull out a politician. That's he, cool. Yeah, he played the politician. That's cool. All right, that's pretty good. Yeah. So now they're to. De Deanna's laying out the the rules on how this guy operates. Is that yeah. he's a docile person who's been programmed, and that programming can be activated through violence. And he has lost all consent over his life and how it's run, and how he no longer has free will. And of course, in the Federation, everyone has to have free will. And the reason why this is a big issue is that the the planet in which he comes from wants to join the Federation. So that means you need to share Federation values with your citizens in order to become a member. Yeah, exiled. Mm -hmm. So he is an android? No, he's a, a psychological... He's Captain America. He's psycho psychological programming, so... Yeah, he's been enhanced. Okay. Well, there's also some bio drugs that are infused in him to make him stronger and faster. And he's Captain Angosia. Basically. <laughs> Except with less of a cool suit. I don't know, that's a pretty cool suit. Yeah. Well, I don't know. Why do you have blue next to yours? You <laughs> ask each other how. Why are your sleeves missing? Actually, the reason why Data's eyes are yellow is because his synthetic liver never really did the job too oh. well. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Flick. <laughs> that, that's yeah. That'd be the final revenge on uh, on Wesley is. He's just bugging Jordy too much. And Jordy's like, you know, Data has a still in its corner. <laughs> he does. <laughs> Beverly's like, that poor kid. He would have been dead if he'd ingested any of this. Literally any of it. Yes, it's liquid nicotine. It does kill people. But I agree it's possible. So here's a guy who does not trust the system. He's cynical. Because... The Enterprise crew is telling this individual, use the support system of doctors and counselors and psychologists. 
But the problem in this guy's history is that those were the professionals responsible for his condition. Yeah, his jailer is called the psych, the psychological... Uh, Criminal psychologist. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All of a sudden, I'm getting flashbacks to... Uh, what's that film with the monkeys? Or not the monkeys, the Planet of the Apes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, the complaint from the the human uh, Charleston Heston plays is, you know, the society is completely upside down, and then the, the the lead ape just says, "Well, of course the society is completely upside down because you you occupy the lowest level of it." Mm-hmm. And and I wonder, I wonder if they could have done a better job selling the culture of the Angosians here, and explaining the necessity of having these soldiers because there's two sides to every story and i don't necessarily want to see the ingosians uh apologizing for what they did but they could have kind of gone into a better better depth of why was it they were so desperate that they had to do this to their own people well they put them in the situation that is the situation that they're the most desperate about there's a they essentially leave them in the middle of a prison riot at the end of this mm, true Let's go well you made your bed lay in it yep so this kind of goes into what i was saying it's like is the soldier an android no he was psychologically programmed and so now they're talking to each other, it's like, oh, well, you were electronically programmed, and I was psychologically programmed, and they're kind of sharing stories about that. Like, what can you do? I don't know. What can you do? And this would have been a good time. This would have been a good place for Worf to be. Where he's like, no, I come from a culture where war, where being a warrior is part of it. Mm. It's not a segregated society at all. Uh, it's that's like true. everybody respects that idea, mm-hmm. and it's, it's like. You know, I know pe- you know, I know people that have killed and are okay now. Mm-hmm. Well, Worf has agency. Yeah. yeah this Worf, guy does not. Worf wouldn't Worf would just be more miffed at why are you so messed up? If I had killed eighty four people, you, you know how cool I'd yeah, be. Yeah, like I'd be proud. I wouldn't be in tattered clothing, I'd be dressed in gold robes. And, <laughs> yeah, so Worf it just would never occur to Worf to be depressed because of this. He would be more like, and what was the name of that doctor again? And yeah. how many open appointments does he have? Because he would be less like, you know, you know, couldn't get back into society. No, I would know immediately where to go and who to talk to about what I was feeling because we're we're structured, we're a you know group that's like structured around war. Now, if I hurt my foot real bad and couldn't walk, well, that's what they talk about. Is they it, don't yeah. have doctors. Yeah, it's, you know, I broke my back. My only remedy is to stab myself in the chest with a knife. If I go around on a mass murdering spree, the bar is going to buy me around. <laughs> so they pretty much explained in the scene that we sympathize with your situation, but there's nothing we can do because we have to follow the laws of the Angosians. There is no extradition treaty. Honestly, you know, if there is no extradition treaty, they could have just given this guy uh, asylum. No. No. No? That's not how it works. No, the Prime Directive. In fact, I, what, why didn't they even entertain that argument here? Because they can't. He is he is legitimately in their penal system. Mm-hmm. Mm. It's like, say... Just because their, their laws are different, it's one of those. He's legitimately... Then they have made a legitimate claim that he's doing it. They have open diplomatic relations, so... It, it is quite probable there is an extradition. I love the design of that ship. It, it, it would be very much like, say, you're in, um, say, like you're in Russia for whatever reason, not even as a mil- not even as a military thing, and somebody who is in prison for being gay escapes, and you're like, I'm going to make sure you never have to go back to prison. The, go- the you, both the U.S. government and the Russian government are going to intervene and go, Yeah, sorry, you don't get to make that choice. It is a crime in Russia, and you have to put. You yeah, we don't agree with it, yeah. but it is a legitimate on the books <laughs> law that they didn't just make up out of the blue. I mean, it's a you know, it's a it's horrible. Yeah, but it's it's the law. We don't have a choice. So here we're transitioning into an action phase where the guy beams out and he somehow breaks the transfer. I know, he just like, pulls it apart like a shower curtain. This, is, this is awesome, though. I it's mean, it like, baffles O'Brien that he's able to do this. 
It's, That's not what it's I trans, down somebody It's when transporter Tai Chi, really. God, you love that. Deanna goes, he'll be killed. So what does everybody do? They pull their guns out. Yeah. Oh, He's going to get killed. We're going to kill him. I was, I was like counting the number of people in a room in a scene because it, that's where you can find a lot of the mistakes. So knowing, so Worf knowing what he knows now, and having to you know go through a huge, I mean his Worf's job would so be on the line after all this happened. It's like so you're you know a couple of seconds in transport. And you see him trying to escape. How about instead of just drawing your weapon, you fire that weapon? Yes. Well, that's actually one of the that's one of the complaints about this show is that your your strongest guy, your toughest guy, gets his butt kicked all the time. Well, second strongest ever, data. Yeah. Well, that's um, what's that's what's so funny about Deep Space Nine is when he's complaining to Odo about station security, and Odo just goes, "Well, let me pull this pad out list every time you fucked up security oh, on the great. flagship of the Federation mm-hmm. in deep space." It just starts listing out all the times they were taken over in the most ridiculous fashion. Hey, there's that old uniform that we noticed yep. in the previous episode. So yeah, you're right. They do they do kind of recycle some of the uniforms. And I love Riker's idea that they can get this guy in a trap somehow still, even though he's evaded it three times. Yeah, Mr. Worf, we need you to lay out some cheese and crackers on the ground here and we'll get a big cargo container with a stick on it. There's a phaser on overload. So the the fear is that the phaser is going to explode and kill a whole bunch of people. Oh, he stopped it. Yep. Defies the laws of physics because you can just turn it down and that energy that was all built up just stops being energy. It's gotta go somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> he pulled out the battery. Yeah. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> so he got movie punched. Yeah. He did like a triple axle spin there. <laughs> I'm gonna punch him and I'm gonna look pretty well doing yeah. it. Acting! <laughs> My mom said these ballet classes would pay off. She was wrong. I remember. That's why hearing, you don't do one man centuries either. I remember hearing uh, in something similar. Uh, but that guy's just spread out on the table yeah. there, just. Yeah, just lay down. Like, like he's not, you know, he's not pressing a whole bunch of buttons, destroying the engines. He's just laying on it. So with their stuntmen taking ballet lessons, there was an NFL team that gave their players uh, some ballet lessons. Oh, they yeah. still do that. Yeah. That's yeah, still a common practice. Yeah. It does keep you limber, but... <laughs> so here we go. They're walking. It's They're walking. You, it's just when you tackle somebody, they don't do a triple axle spin on the NFL <laughs> and another, then hit the floor out. Another acting choice versus directing choice here. I'm just imagining them being like, okay, so... So Lavar, he's gonna come down to the warp core and then beat you up. No, he isn't. And it's like uh, Jordy isn't gonna let him get to the warp core without like dying in the process. Okay, uh, how do you feel about being found like lying there with just the visor on the ground? That's fine. I'm not gonna let you have this guy come beat me up. On <laughs> okay. Well, you, you rarely see the character Jordy going hands on with anybody. He's, he's very much the, uh, the passenger. He sure as hell would have in that situation. Yeah, yeah he's not going to go on an armed away team, but yeah, in the engine room? No, yeah. That, what gets me is how easy it is just to get in there. That would be a sealed, secured area, as just as secure as the brig. Like, you no, wait, the, just, brig, the brig's not too secure, man. <laughs> well, no, nothing is on this <laughs> ship. This guy literally... And this is the, the, the nice Jeffrey's tube where you can walk upright in it. You never see these anymore. I wonder if that was a piece of uh, the Enterprise from Star Trek V that so looks oh. a lot like one of the corridors in it. Well, no, oh. so Star Trek V was just redressed Star Trek The Next Generation sets. Okay. Mm-hmm. Man, they pulled a data trick from the first episode where you just take out all the chips from that exact panel. And... Acknowledged. They not the reactor core and got into a Jeffrey's tube. Jeffrey's hallway. He could be anywhere. It's a big ship. So here's where I'm wondering why they don't use more site-to-site transport. 
Exactly. It's like, why wear out your security team running or walking quickly 25 decks? So now we're going into another act of sabotage for misdirection. And Data's going to pick up on it. He's going to realize, hey, this guy creates high-profile yeah. sabotage to lead you, know, you down should, trail A. These panels in the Jeffrey's tubes, we should maybe uh, have it so that you know, I need an engineering key to get in. I mean, it, <laughs> what? Like what? Nah. What do you think? What do you think, LaForge? Uh, check out my last ninety memos. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's funny because there's an episode where a kid falls over and hits a pad with his hand, and he's convinced he blew up the ship because of it. And they have to they have to walk him back from that. Yeah, I imagine that. Oh, you know, we just talked about the bonding. There are a lot of kids on that ship that have horrible PTSD and think stuff like that could happen all the time. I mean, if you know about Q, it's like you could be, you'd be lined up at night scared that, like, I wished in my head that my mom and dad were dead, and I know that there's something in the world that exists that could do, that could kill them because I thought about it. <laughs> oh, Worf in the cargo bay. This is his biggest, this is Worf's biggest screw up for the whole thing. This would be the one they'd be running drills on forever. And I like how that cargo bay is just like, oh, we're just going to put a couple of things in random spots, you know. Just... So they try to gas him. He puts on an environmental suit that was in the room because, of course, you know, if you're in an area that has gas like that, you're going to have PPE. Well, no, so you probably would because that's got an exterior cargo yeah. door. So you'll have... That's what I, I was... I wasn't yeah. being sarcastic. I meant it, you know. Well, not because of gases, but because of yeah. decompression. Yeah. There is personal protective equipment around stuff like that. Now... He uses the phaser in the, in the transporter. Sensors show it has the same concentration, 70 parts per Yeah, use it to power the transporters. Like jump start in your car. I'm going to use bullets to turn the bus After off. he does all this, they don't even sweep the room. They just assume that he's gotten away. So all this security team is going to be going on drills and drills and drills that where they have to sweep the room to like a greater and greater degree to determine whether or not the person they're looking for is or is not hiding in it. And they have those because they go in Deep Space Nine, which is not too many years off of this, where they have those ability to just sweep a room with a phaser. I want to know why they came down with just three guys. I know. They did not take Jordy's advice to double To the double them. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, God, yeah. I would have brought ten guys with me. Yeah. And I would have had another five standing right outside the door. Good job, Worf. Good job. Yeah. Wow. He just walked down one corridor of this big bay. Oh, we didn't find anything. And then they... And then so they to be the, fair, Worf does suspect something's not right and sticks yeah. around. But. Well, but I mean, Riker's theory that he, like, he, he's probably climbed outside the ship and it's like spider monkey outside. As and they're going at whatever the speed they're going like, at. Yeah, sure, sure he is, Riker. <laughs> So, did he put the pressure suit on no. to avoid the gas? No, he just held his breath. Of course. He's physically enhanced, so he could probably hold his breath for three or four minutes. And they'd have to ungas the room for the security guards to go in. Yeah, and he knew that. Why don't you just shoot him? Why do you have to give him a compliment? Exactly. But the battle is over. He believes in honor. Well, he wants to go without a fight. Walk the bridge. No, no, you, you don't. No, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> Standing next to him, maybe. Which... So, uh, Dinar's phaser thing exploded, and now there's a fight. Worf always has bad luck in cargo bays. Yeah. Unable to transfer control, sir. So there's a fist fight. To a lot of apparently empty containers. <laughs> this could just be back from storage. This is where we store Super empty light. containers. Yeah. Well, it's right. like in that episode where the the thing falls on uh, Those are on all warp and cripples foam. him. You yeah. can tell that it you know has nothing inside of it. Mm -hmm. It just bounces. Yeah. So he finally gets on the transporter pad where he powered it with the phaser, and he's beaming where? There. Uh, onto, onto the, the shot of the ship. prison ship. Yeah. Which I love the 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 
the uh, front of that ship looks very much like a Star Wars shuttle. Yeah, I was thinking space balls myself. Huh, yeah. But now, you know, the Enterprise, <laughs> their role is done. They could just leave right now. Yep. Well, they want, they want to rub it in the in the people's faces before they leave. <laughs> but I mean, that's what they're going to do, is they're going to leave. But first they want to be like, and you know what? Nya, 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 nya. Yeah. I don't have the prisoner anymore, Bridge. You said you had him, Mark. You yeah. said you had him. Craig was like, wait, you mean he's not on the outer hole? <laughs> <laughs> All external sensors are still not functioning. I have no way to track him. That was his plan out all along. Look and the Captain Hindsight Award goes to <laughs> Commander Riker. <laughs> so sensors down is a big thing on a ship because you need to know where you're going. And you need to see. If sensors are down, that means the view screen wouldn't work, technically. Because the view screen is just the information from the sensors, right? Yeah. They should uh, send Jenny, uh, Jenny. They should send Jordy back to the observation lounge. Everybody, go to the window with binoculars. So, what's going on the here? The frozen yogurt stand has been overturned. Yeah, this is the this is the big uh, big prison riot. So, the, oh, so he went back to the lunar colony, started a riot, freed his buddies. All right. So why are they still here? They could go right now. Why are they going to the planet? Well, because again, that they got said, it's one of those one. Yeah, it's they're so, they're just going down there to rub it in their face. And, and, and like, they, your plan didn't work, and we don't I'd be like, like where are you going, Mister Worf? Don't you have some battle drills you need to be running? Well, th- well, this is th- this happens. It's kind of it's kind of cool. It doesn't go where I had hoped it would, but why would those five go? I don't get it. <laughs> There is no reason for Data to go. Well, they've seen how Data are fight, so they think Data is the only one who can fight. Here we go. Yeah, Data is the strongest yeah, out of all of them. So, oh, okay, you are personally responsible for the captain's security, and you screwed up. <laughs> don't do it like you did in that one. Uh, yeah, a one, couple, one, minute, one couple minutes ago. Yeah, <laughs> and don't just sidestep when you hear a gunfire. No, handing out the weapons. <laughs> So the interesting thing, you notice how Riker's always leaning on stuff and the way he always like raises his leg over a chair and sits funny? Yeah. It's because he injured his back early in his career as a because he was a furniture mover. Oh. He was what? also Captain oh, America. You mean the actor? Was, uh, right yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> so he can't, uh, he has he has trouble, you know, standing up straight all, all the time. He's got a bad, uh, suffered bad back injuries. Hmm. So that's why he's always leaning or sitting weird, sitting forward. And... So he's Picard is telling off the president on just the the nya 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 nya, right? Yep. Why don't you reverse the effects if you have the skills to create the soldier system? Hmm. But we're not so you can be created and can you uncreate them? Pretty much. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> Even before the training began, we knew there would be problems. We had our best best phrenologist on it. Did you reveal that risk to the men who volunteered for service? We were helping them to survive the war. You understand? They needed those. Skills. Oh, so much political commentary. <laughs> right. Well, the. The whole thing, the whole thing is about you're using your own population for your own, for your own means. It was the will of the people. We do that today, now. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. I'm like, it's such political commentary here. The costs involved. They chose the settlement solution. Besides, we may need to use them again someday. I don't think you'll ever be able to use them if they're not even following your instructions. Oh, there's the 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 dirty dozen has have broken in. Don't respond. Don't provoke them further. Keep those weapons down unless you wish to be killed. So, just now Picard figured out if you act aggressive towards them, they will respond to you. Yep. 
You you think they would have figured that out a lot earlier? Well, the whole time they were in security recapture attack mode. True. Fight or flight. Yeah, at no time did they walk up and say, freeze, don't move. It was just immediately pull weapons on them. I mean, from the minute the transporter beam started getting fuzzy. It would have been interesting to have where they talked about, you know, the resettlement and how they'd done things. It was like, you know, all of this was decided, you know, before our grandfathers were born. This is our way of life. It's like, you know, have, it, have you ever, you know, tested it since then? No, we're not, you know, we're not interested in doing that. Pretty much. So yeah. We're interested in having soldiers, not reintegrating soldiers. I think Troy just said, preach it. So he said, uh, he said, to, to live is not enough, to survive is not enough. And Deanna says, preach it. No. What Tell them what you want. What do you want? Yeah. Yeah. I would be willing. But Mr. Prime Minister... With the all due respect. respect, you will have to force us. Yeah. Or at least try. You think these guys want to go death by cop? No. No. They actually want what they say they want. Yeah. But they are willing to die yeah. if they don't get it. Okay. Death by cop would have been It'd basically be if he if he killed all those people, got you know, drove to the Enterprise, started firing on the Enterprise, and the Enterprise blew him off. That's death by cop. Yeah, he wouldn't have evaded them if he just flown right at them. Okay. And forced them to fire on them. There's one of those. Either you destroy me, or I'm going to fly right into your ship. Yep. So now that uh, here's the teaching moment, Picard's going to say, "You made your bed. Now you got to lay in it." But I wouldn't want to live here. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> Thank you, Nod. Yeah. Everybody's happy that they're not shot. Yep. I would have loved to see, like, just the next two minutes. So, uh, you guys want some tea or something? <laughs> <laughs> um, what do we do, bridge? <laughs> so, that's that's about the end. This Is, is yeah. this a feel-good ending? Not really. Number there, one, uh, how do you feel about standing here on the bridge in that smug for a minute? Sounds good to me. Yeah. I, hey, uh, the lights just went out down there. Oh, yeah, that was the power plant. Of, <laughs> looks like the prisoners took that over. Well, this is really a... It's a calm ending. I, I think they had to fill it because we're so used to abrupt endings in this show. Oh, there's, there's the meme right there. Engage. Is that it? Yep. Or one of them. Yep. Well, there's the end yeah, of the Yeah, in the HD, you just see, like, massive lightning strikes down there. And yeah. Little, yeah. Little like nuclear missiles pilots. crossing over. And, <laughs> and then Picard going, if they survive the night, you just hear yeah. this flash on the if screen. If they survive the night. I have, I have a feeling that they'll decide, too. Let's, uh, what's, what's, the, what's our movie this week? Christopher Nolan's The Dark Knight. Yeah. <laughs> The boat scene. <laughs> oh, brother. Yeah, I don't know. I, I have really mixed feelings. So they're kind of pretentious and preachy in this episode. Oh, yeah. But it's it's very much, you made your mess and we're not going to bail you out. Uh, they really had to rub it in to the Angosians about how bad it really is. And it just it's because that's what the, the Federation, it's virtue, is a very smug organization. They truly believe they're better than everybody. And that's what pisses off a lot of these other societies, and rightfully so. So they're, they're very, they're very. We have better values. We're more advanced. We're more civilized than all of you. And if you can somehow drag yourself out of the dirt to reach our level, we'll let you join our country club. And and that's why you get. And that's why people like you know, a lot of, or you know, there are a lot of species who even just who aren't necessarily the bad guys are just like, no, we don't like the Federation. Well, the Klingons even called the Federation the Homo Sapiens Only Club. Yeah, well, and they look at the other episode we did, The Price. You know, and they say not everybody wants to do business with the Federation. You know, it's... So, how many how many disgruntled uh, soldiers do you give this episode? Start with Nigel. 
Uh, can I give it three? I've seen the episode before. I didn't particularly like the ending because I didn't really get a resolution. I mean, yes, the Angosians didn't join the Federation, but what's going to happen? The prisoner guy. I think he. I think he was. A lot of what I liked about the episode, like, there was a good balance of action, good characters, but for me it's an okay episode, it's not really a great episode. I'd have to concur. Uh, watching this as a kid, I loved the action, I thought it was super cool, and I remember watching Bacard and the, his posse beam out, and I thought, oh, they're gonna get it, but we never got to see <laughs> the getting gotten good. So, uh, you know, nowadays when I watch it, uh, I, I'm amused by the action and the, and the funny stunts, but uh, you could have boiled down this episode into about 10 minutes and I would have gotten the same value out of it. So, you know, for that, I'd give it a, probably the same score as Nigel, about three disgruntled uh, soldiers. How about you, Jim? I'd probably give it about a two, which is a little higher than the last episode, only because there seemed to be more of a draw for me just because of like the, the psychological aspects and the interactions the human interaction and you know point to point like how do you feel about that sort of thing but the plot wasn't all that interesting to me I'll give it a three um, I liked just watching um, you know them not be prepared for who this guy was and continuing to fail over and over again. It was an interesting experience. It would have been cool to see what would have happened had uh, Yar still been there hmm. and had done, you know, more of an assessment of what the planet was like and everything and have her and her and Worf kind of butt heads over how they wanted to handle it. That would have be been really, really interesting. Because she... Uh, Yar came from a world that was sort of what this place is going to become in a couple of weeks. <laughs> where it was, you know, just kind of, you know, full full scale chaos with, you know, no real plan on how to fix it. Of course, Yara had no problem preaching the way or imposing herself on. Her. Oh, very true. Especially if it was, you know, something like drugs or, you know, any any moral, what have you. But this would have affected her specifically. Just because it would have been so familiar to her environment. There, there would have been some empathy there in how she handled the situation. She was a lot more Starfleet, too. She followed Picard's orders. Mm -hmm. She was also a fully trained security person. Worf was made security yep. chief, but if remember, he wasn't. He didn't have a security background that right. we've seen. He was in operations. He, oh, he, he, right. he, he sat next to Data on the bridge. In the ops, you know, or in the you know the he's con the position, you can kind of see it with a lot of uh, the, the the dumber stuff Riker says about what he's doing. Like there won't be a second for him to get away, or he probably got outside the ship and is running around. It's like Riker was Picard's, like, okay, Mister Riker, who should replace Troy? Well, the biggest dumbest guy we got. Yeah, <laughs> Worf, Worf, he's obviously you know <laughs> he's a lunkhead. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's just not that. It's just he's the Klingon. He's the warrior guy. It's like no. I mean, in all honesty, I would have put Data in charge of security, just because he's by the books, he's strong, he knows all the regulations, he can think quicker, he can analyze. But that's, you don't need empathy when it comes to security. Yeah. But it's question it's questioning uh, Data's fitness for command, which is kind of the the great experiment of that ship. Yeah, it is, but you know, but I mean, just you know, from a tactical standpoint, anything like that. But yeah, you put War was like, well, yeah, you come from a you, but. You're not. You weren't raised on Kronos as a warrior. You were raised by a pair of Russians on Earth. <laughs> you know, who? It's just. Yeah, you. It's like you've read about Klingon culture. You're not really Klingon. It's like I'm Korean. Yeah. But you know, I've read a little bit about it. Never actually spent any time really in Korea. Spent more time in Eastern Europe than I have in Korea. Yep. So it's just. Yeah. No. I'm. I'm gonna give it two and a half. Just because I like uh, I like seeing O'Brien actually do something other than just go, huh? My uh, panel lit up and then yeah, didn't. O'Brien had a really good good show in that. He was the mo out, out of all of the people fighting there, Dan out there, he was the most competent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, he got his ass handed to him, but you expect that because he's a you know the guy's a good soldier. But at least he gave he was more he he wasn't just dancing around the guy. He actually got into it, which really isn't his job. 
He landed a few good blows. He was actually to shoot, he was able to shoot the guy after getting tossed around from across the room. <laughs> you know, and you know, and if you look at the way their phasers are, they don't aim phasers. They shoot from the hip with phasers. So they're not like a regular gun where you're looking down the sights. So for me, it's like taking the TV remote and pointing it at you and hitting you in a critical spot. That's not easy to do when you're, you know, shooting from the hip like that. So it actually shows that he's probably a pretty good shot. And they hadn't established that he was a soldier before doing this yet. You don't get that until much uh, later on. Yeah, we're, it's not until the the Cardassian episode. Have, have, we haven't done that. We're wounded, and that yeah, comes up in, I think, next season. Mm -hmm. And that you find out that he was actually a tactical officer before he was. Yeah, on the Rutledge. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, that, yeah, it's, so he actually, he's in there pretty good. And then, yeah, it's just the whole Riker and his baking... Stupid comfortable. He's on the hull of the ship. <laughs> really? Man? That's the best we could come up with. He's not crawling through the air ducts or something. I could buy that, you know. No. He's yeah, he's scaling the outside of the ships. He's out there. You see like the nineteen sixties Batman style. Yeah. Where he's just going up on the side of the windows and stuff like that. <laughs> he's oh, just... That would have been great. Okay, well, there it is, folks. We hope you enjoyed this as much as we've had uh, watching it. Um, the uh, If you want to contact us, we're at nextgenfirstgenpod at gmail.com. And we look forward to hearing from you. And with that, have a wonderful day. So you're the guest. So Sasha, what's so, a Star Trek? Hi, I am the guest. So Sasha, what is Star Trek? <laughs> Seek us out at Next Generation's First Generation at iTunes, Google Play, and YouTube. Music credits include Electric Car by Poddington Bear, Broke for Free, As Colorful as Ever. 71017 by Poratex. Sweet Potato Pudding by Red Star Martyrs. Nebuchadnezzar's Dream of Four Kings by OLM. Audio Engineering by Sasha Shouties. Chief Meme Maker and episode cover credit goes to Matthew Kirshner. Logo and graphic art design credit goes to David Clawwitter. And special thanks to Patrick Delmore for working with other podcasts to make sure the good work gets out. Do you have a podcast that you think people should be listening to? Send us your promos and we'll play them on the show. If you'd like to email the show, you can email us at nextgenfirstgenpod at gmail.com. I've been Patrick Delmore. And this is Sasha Shouties. Thank you very much for listening and have a wonderful day. Good night.